Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope that you can all hear me. I say good afternoon, but for some of you who are in the States, uh, I think it's probably more appropriate to say good morning. But uh, it's nice to see people from as far afield as Johannesburg and, uh, and the States and Milan and so on. It's uh, nice, to, nice to see the people who logged on. Um, my name is Guy Levine. I'm actually the, the managing director of um, Gemba Limited. And Gemba Limited is the private company that we've set up uh, to invest in conservation and in um, building of tourist lodges in Ethiopia, the first of which is Bali Mountain Lodge, set up in the Bali Mountains National Park of, of Ethiopia. Uh, we only have 20 minutes or so to talk on this, so forgive me, this, is, this will be a fairly rapid run-through. I'm conscious that also I'm not an expert on, uh, on webinars. This is the first time I've done this, so I hope that you'll forgive me if... Uh, if it's uh, a little scratchy at times. Um, what I want to do is run through a program here that talks about, not just about Bali Mountain Lodge, but first about Ethiopia. Um, many of you will already know some of the stuff that, I, that I'm talking about, but uh, I, I hope you'll forgive me for that. And then we'll move on to the, the lodge itself and go through some of the, uh, the details of what we're doing with the lodge and why we think it's so special. For those of you who want to, to talk privately to us or, or ask questions after the, the webinar, please feel free to, uh, to, to type your questions down in, in, the, in the box, but also uh, feel free to contact us at info at barleymountainlodge.com, info at barleymountainlodge.com, should you wish to, uh, to ask questions of us, or, or log on to our website, which is www.barleymountainlodge.com, and uh, hopefully a lot of your answers will be, a lot of your questions will be answered during this, uh, this webinar. The logo you see in front of you is, uh, is obviously based on the, the Bali wolf, uh, the Ethiopian wolf. The Ethiopian wolf is, a, uh, is the world's rarest canid, and you've, there are 500 of them left in the world, and some 350 or two-thirds of the population is in the Bali Mountains National Park. And we're very proud to, uh, to say that we give access to this beautiful animal um, for people who come and stay at the lodge. Or we, it is actually the, the flagship um, species that exists in the Bali Mountains, alongside many other endemic and, and rare species. First of all, uh, for those of you who say who don't necessarily know Ethiopia, um, Ethiopia is a beautiful country. It's the uh, it's the the world's oldest Christian um, state. Uh, Christianity in Ethiopia predates Roman Christianity for by about 150 years, uh, and the the split of, of of religions in the country is largely is is basically 70% Christian, 30% Muslim, with the Muslim uh, population largely being down in the valleys to the the uh, the east and south and the Christian population being up in the highlands of Ethiopia, the old Abyssinian lands. And undoubtedly in Ethiopia, the, the, the draw for most tourists is up in the north, where the, uh, the northern uh, cultural route uh, takes in the uh, Lake Tana monasteries based from Bahadar uh, up to Gonda for the 400-year-old castles up in Gonda, the Simeon Mountains National Park where you can see gelada baboons and other rare species, uh, up to Aksum, where the Ark of the Covenant is is uh, believed to be housed, and is certainly um, under the Ethiopian Orthodox religion, that is the home of the of the Ark of the Covenant. And then you come through between Aksum and Mekele into the the Gralta Valley, with its churches carved into sandstone cliffs, and really spectacularly beautiful. My favourite part of Ethiopia in the north. And then you come down to Lalibela, really the the jewel in the Ethiopian crown, with its uh, thousand year old rock hewn churches. And as somebody who's lived in uh, four African countries, Nigeria and Ghana and Kenya and here, uh, and, and worked and across the continent. Uh, Ethiopia really has a depth of culture that no other African country can boast. And that is, uh, as far as, uh, as I'm concerned, it's, it's a magnificent country and one that shouldn't be missed on any tourist itinerary. In the south also, many of you will have heard of the Omo Valley. Uh, the remote tribes of the Omo Valley, particularly the, the, the Mercy and the Hama, are very well known. Uh, sadly, uh, we feel that the, the, the expansion of the road down there and the new dam on the Omo River may mean that this particular part of Ethiopia will suffer in the future, and we're hoping that uh, uh, active government activity can prevent it from being lost to, uh, to us. But uh, it's, it's still worth it, very much worth a visit. And what we are saying is that the Bali Mountains is, should be put onto any itinerary, and that there is actually a loop in the south of the country that shouldn't be missed that incorporates the Rift Valley Lakes the Bali Mountains National Park, and some Muslim culture at the, the, the largest limestone caves in Africa, the, the Sof Omar Caves, and Dira Sheikh Hussein, which is a, um, a very important Muslim pilgrimage site. 
ultimately, we hope that we might be able to link the, the Muslim city of Hara, the walled city of Hara, which is the fourth holiest city in, 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 in Islam, into that southern loop. Certainly a part of Ethiopia that we believe should not be missed and that will enhance any particular trip to Ethiopia. To put that into some form of, of detail, that southern loop, um, when you come out of Addis Ababa, you take a road south to Butajira. If you, if you don't come down the main road, which is the red road, you come down this yellow road uh, out, of, out of Addis Ababa. And on that, there are a number of attractions in itself. The most southerly rock-hewn church of Adadi Mariam is on that road. The, uh, the Melka Kunture Standing Stones and the, and the UNESCO World Heritage Site at uh, Tia are all on that road and are, are very much worth visiting. And it takes about two and a half hours to come down that road and then turn down to the, to the Rift Valley Lakes. And in the Rift Valley Lakes, again, you have a number of different attractions. Lake Ziwe is a, is a working lake. A lot of the, the fish that are eaten in Addis Ababa come from Lake, lake Ziwe. Uh, they fish in small boats, and you see the, the gutting and the preparation of the fish and the, the, the cutting of fillets on, this, on, the, on the lake shore. Also, there's a, a monastery on an island in the middle of the lake, which again is worth, very much worth a visit and is part of now of a community tourism pro, pro, uh, project that's being um, developed and, and, and uh, pushed by the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority and Sustainable Tourism Alliance, and certainly a, a worth, worth a day trip. Um, Lake Langano, slightly further south on the east of the road. Um, we, we think if you come from Addis Ababa to the Bali Mountains National Park, you should really split your journey. And there are a number of lodges around there, a number of hotels around there, the best of which we believe to be Bishingari on the, the, the southeast corner of the lake. And we're hoping to form some form of partnership with Bishingari so that we can um, bounce people through Langano and, and then down to the, to the, uh, the Bali Mountains National Park. And on there, um, also, there are there are hippos that you can swim from a lovely beach. The, the Bishingare Lodge has a, a nice treehouse bar, very nice accommodation and very good food. So um, um, we, we recommend it. Opposite side of the road, um, the, the lakes of Shala and Abiata, uh, one the deepest lake in Ethiopia, the other the shallowest with hot springs. Um, and uh, it's flamingos on the, on the, in the hot water. Um, a little bit run down as a, as a, as a national park, but frankly, uh, we are pushing also to help do some development work on there to improve the tourist offering down there in Lake Shala, Abiata, Lakes Shala and Abiata. And we're hoping that over the next two to three years that will become a, a, a very worthwhile addition to any route down to us. Further down is the, uh, the Bali Mountains National Park. This is where we are located and I'll, I'll talk about that in some detail later. So I'll, I'll skim over that. And then to the, to the east and north of us are the Sof Omar Caves, which are a, a perfectly accessible day trip from the lodge there and back. And also further north, the, uh, the Dira Sheikh Hussein um, pilgrimage site. Uh, we have aspirations in the future, maybe to, to set up a high quality tented camp just to the north of Dira Sheikh Hussein in the Wabi Valley, um, really remote, very beautiful part of Ethiopia. But if we could do that, we would then be able to link by road the Bali Mountains to Hara in the, in the northeast. Uh, to the northeast east of our region, um, so that but that's that's not available yet, and certainly at the moment we're advocating that people come down to the Bali Mountains um, as a as a destination, either by road or by by air. There are three charter companies that fly to the to Robe Airport just to the north of the Bali Mountains National Park. Um, so we believe Ethiopia has a lot to offer. We believe it's a country that, that should in, encourage tourism and that uh, tourists that come to Ethiopia uh, have a, an excellent opportunity to have a, a, a very cultural time, but also to see phenomenal scenery and wonderful uh, cultural life. Uh, this view here, to come down to the specifics, is, is the view that we have from the front of our lodge. And we're building in the, uh, in the clearing inside the Herena Forest of the, uh, the Bali Mountains National Park. This main volcanic plug that you see there in front of you is actually Mount Gujarali and it uh, takes about two hours to walk from the lodge to the top of that peak and it is a spectacular walk uh, which is, is interspersed with little openings in the forest so you can see through and you start to see over the canopy of the forest and then when you reach the top the, the forest spreads out as far as the eye can see into the distance and is uh, I mean, actually one of my favourite walks in there, it's, it's lovely. But what we are offering as a, as a company, um, as a lodge, is, uh, is the following. Now, I don't want to go through this in detail. This is on the, on the webinar, and you can have a look at this later. And if you have any questions, um, 
then uh, then maybe we could answer those questions in due course. Um, the, as far as access is concerned, there is actually a, a, a question come up about whether or not we can access by helicopter to the lodge, and we are setting up a helicopter landing site um, on the in one of the clearings that's about uh, 200 meters away from the main lodge. So the answer to that is yes, and I know that uh, Tropic Air from Kenya are, are certainly uh, interested in, in coming up and, and, and arriving by helicopter to us. But I'll allow you to look at these details later, and we can provide any details um, through info at barleymountainlodge.com. Uh, the real main attraction, though, is and the things that really appeal as far as the Bali Mountains are concerned are the endemic birds, wild uh, mammals, and uh, and fauna. Sorry, flora and amphibians. Um, this is a uh, uh, an amazing place. Um, on the slide in front of you, you have uh, the uh, the mountain Nyala on the left hand slide. The bottom slide is uh, wolf Ethiopian wolf pup, uh, pups cubs. Um, the the pig is a is a giant forest hog, and that is actually the size of a a pygmy hippo. It's a pretty impressive animal when you see one. And top right is the uh, the Bali monkey, which and all of these are believed to be endemic. Even the forest hog is believed to have a different skull structure to those found elsewhere in Africa, and is endemic to the uh, to the Bali Mountains. Coupled to that, we have an amazing variety of birds. In total, we believe there's some 240 varieties of birds in the Bali Mountains National Park. Some specialists in the on the, in the high plateau, the the raptors and the uh, and the migratory birds. Um, others are forest birds and or, or, or plains birds up in the north. But here on the slide, you have uh, blue winged goose, an endemic blue winged goose. We have the yellow fronted parrot, um, with the Abyssinian long claw, and actually to the right is Prince Rusporis turaco. Now the turaco doesn't actually live inside the national park. It's a, it's, a, it's found in a small area over the Janali River, about two hours to the south of us, two hours to the south of the park. Um, there's also, just to the south of the park, an area about the size of a football field on which the last 36 pairs, breeding pairs, of the Liban lark can be found. And I know that the bird watchers are particularly um, keen to, uh, to, 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 uh, to see that. Um, here in the park, um, an access to the park is um, via an excellent brand new metal road that comes from Shashamani to Goba, which was finished in October of last year. Um, and then from the north of the park is a an all-weather road that goes across, a picture of which I have in about two slides time. So the road access to the park is excellent and uh, and takes about seven hours door to door from Addis to the, to the lodge. There's also a new road being built just out of Addis that should cu cut time about an hour off the journey uh, on the grounds that it's a three lane motorway and it opens we think in the next three to three to five months. This park is uh, 2,200 square kilometers of Ethiopia and it has three main areas in it. In the top uh, are the uh, um, Gese grasslands and the Gese grasslands are, are relatively flat below the, the main forest um, and they house or they, they are home to um, vast numbers of, of warthog, but also to the mountain Nyala, Menelitz, bushbuck, and so on. So endemic mammals there. And it's nice to wander around that area, wander in and out of the forest lines. But that's very much very near to the road, very easily accessible, and you don't have to come into the main park really to find the Gese grasslands. You then travel up and onto the, the Seneti Plateau. And the Seneti Plateau sits at between 3,800 and 4,500, 4,400 meters. Um, and it is a rugged, wild, rocky area. This is actually um, one of the, the highest roads in Africa. We were claiming it as the highest road in Africa, highest all-weather road in Africa, until two days ago, but we found that the, the road in the Seneti Plateau has just been finished. It comes out of the back end, and we believe that that is now higher than us, so drat, but it's still a very high-level, high-altitude road. Um, the uh, You come south from the Seneti Plateau, and the Seneti Plateau is where the wolves are found where the golden eagles and the lamigaias and the and the and the, the, um, the main uh, raptor raptors are found, and they they stay up there because they eat um, the rodents, and the rodents are giant uh, mole rats, the largest of them, and that is like a rock hyrax or a dassie, as you call them in uh, like in uh, South Africa. Um, but also there are six other endemic species of of, of rodents. And they're not like rats, they're actually little fluffy guinea piggy like, like animals, um, really quite attractive rodents, uh, because they're up high and, they, and it's cold up there. And the beauty of the wolves and the raptors is that the, the, the rodents don't come out until the sun comes up, and so you don't have to do an early morning game drive because the wolves and the, and the birds of prey are hunting mainly during the heat of the day from about 
nine o'clock in the morning through till three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And th those are the best sighting times. So our, our daily routine will be based around a, a nice leisurely breakfast and then off to do activities up on the plateau. Um, also further in, there is a, uh, a magnificent 1500 meter high escarpment, you know, four and a half thousand feet uh, foot escarpment that you descend on the main, uh, on the, on the all weather road and you drop down that 1500 meters in about eight to 10 kilometers down into the forest. And what you do is you come, um, as you come across the top of that, you look down very often at, at fluffy clouds below you um, down in the forest, and forest as far as the eye can see, can, can see. It, it, it is you know, magnificently beautiful. Um, and then you come down the road and into the main Herena forest, which inside the park is about 1,200 square kilometers, but, uh, but actually spreads out for 4,000 square kilometers outside the park as well as in. And in there, um, you come down through layers of vegetation. This is Erica Forest, which on the north side of the park is uh, small heather-like two-foot tall structures, two-foot tall plants. And on our side, on the south, is these uh, tall tree, tree-sized plants. Absolutely the same plant, just growing in a different plant, part of the park in a different way. And then as you come further south, you, 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 you start to see the forest laid out right in front of you. And this particular picture is taken from the top of Mount Gujarali, that rock plug that we can see from the lodge, and the clearing right in the middle of the slide is our um, our clearing, the catcher clearing of the of the of the of the forest. And you can see, if you look closely, the the silver roofs of our service quarter. They're still silver because they haven't yet been thatched. But uh, being a rainforest, obviously, we have to put tin in the roofs to make sure that we are we're completely watertight. And I can provide for anybody who's interested. A, uh, an annual picture of when it rains, what the rainfall is like, what the temperature is like, the best time for viewing uh, animals and birds and so on, and, and uh, provide all that information on request. The forest teams with wildlife. This is a, um, um, a Gureza monkey. They call them a, sorry, Gureza monkey locally. It's a, it's a colobus monkey. And these are very, very common around the lodge, as are um, olive baboons and, and other various, various different types of uh, of wildlife such as uh, jackals and so on. And the lodge itself is set in a nice uh, wooded valley with a, with a river running right the way through the middle of the, of the, of the, uh, of the site. And the river runs from, from left to right as we see it, or from west to east as we're looking at it. And to the south side of the river is a very steep slope, a wooded, wooded slope, and that is in where we're putting most of our, of our rooms for the lodge. To give you some idea of scale, from the, the main lodge to the to the lake to the, the the bottom end of the lake is probably about 100 meters so it's not a big site it's eight hectares but the distances that guests have to walk are not particularly um, long but every room is secluded from it, any other and each has its own view and its own deck and we uh, we believe we're, we're providing something really quite special here in the forest um, the road into our site we've, we've built it was a road the, the lake that you see on that plan was originally a quarry it was a quarry for, uh, designed to build the, the north-south road, or weather road, but we've taken it, we've landscaped it, and we've filled it in, and that will, um, that hopefully will attract more bird life um, into the site. But the road now uh, extends right into the site, down to our service quarters, down in the bottom right-hand corner there, which are um, well away from our guest areas, but close enough, obviously, to provide support and administration. Interesting, one of those five blocks that we have in the bottom right-hand corner there, we are setting aside as a research block, and we're employing on in the site a, a resident naturalist. He's a Kenyan ornithologist who has been in Catcher for three years on the trot, um, doing bird monitoring and bird tagging to uh, to try and assess the effects of climate change in uh, in in Ethiopia. And this is one of the sites they've been using. And James Ndungu was his name, and he's uh, he he asked us if we uh, would be interested in a resident ornithologist or resident naturalist and we, we jumped at the idea because we believe it gives our guests somebody that they can tap into for information and somebody that uh, can coordinate our guide activity and uh, and so on. The main lodge is in the middle of the site in a in, a, in an open valley that, that looks down to the river and from the back we've, we've carved it into the hillside slightly to reduce the visual impact of the main lodge so that you don't really see this from the back as you approach on that red road. And then either side of the lodge are where our rooms are, five to the east, seven to the to the west, um, and in total we have 15 rooms, um, with three rooms being in the main lodge itself, um, and that actually um, the uh, 
the, the three rooms in the lodge are all uh, disa fully disabled access and good for families. So that if you are in, a fo in the forest and you don't wish to be away from the main lodge, that maybe the wildlife uh, concerns you or you have mobility issues, those three rooms are ideal uh, to, to, for, for those sort of guests. And each of our rooms, as I mentioned earlier, are um, beautifully situated. Each looks in a different direction. Some are, are optim optimized for the morning sunshine, others for the evening sunshine, but all of them are secluded and large and beautiful and well appointed. This is a, an honest impression of the main lodge. At the moment we are putting the verticals in and we're putting the roof in by the end of May uh, and then we'll be doing the finishing off through, through uh, June, July and August. Um, this looks rather harsh. We believe that, uh, that through judicious planting and a bit of landscaping we, we intend to soften this whole approach. It is made of local stone and with a thatched central tuckle lodge but uh, and all the rooms to the, to the right of that picture, those three rooms are each um, detached from each other and, and the decks are, are five meters apart so quite a, a lot of seclusion even in those three rooms that are in the main lodge but again we will soften this and this is this was taken about uh, two weeks ago and it was the construction of one of our rooms to the east of the main lodge um, as you can see it also has a tin roof but it will be lined with uh, bamboo on the inside and thatched on the outside so you won't see any of that but as I said before um, we are in a rainforest there is nothing we can do about it um, we need to protect from the, from the rain um, most of the year um, October through till March is beautifully dry um, April, May, June um, you have the short rains followed by another period of dry, uh, dry weather and the main rainy season is July, August, September if you're in Bali in those times, it is a phenomenal time to be there. Every, there is more of everything, more wildlife, more, more beautiful plants. Um, it's verdant and stunning, but it is very wet. So we understand that it's, it's not a time that is easy to sell for people who wish to, wish to sell it. Um, I'm skipping through. Uh, we are uh, fully eco-friendly. We're putting a 22 micro, uh, uh, kilowatt micro hydro plant in the river. All of our water is managed properly. Um, we take our, our drinking water from the river and, and filter it and clean it and then put it through UV. All of our waste goes into the biogas unit and so on and so forth. Firewood is taken from outside the park. So it's uh, it, we're fully eco-friendly. And we also have in the river a, uh, a dip pool which, which we're putting a, a sauna and a charcoal fridge and so people can go down and have a sauna, have a swim and, uh, and have a, a cool glass of wine and, and, and lays in the sunshine down in the bamboo forest. Um, one thing I didn't mention, that uh, the rivers uh, to the north of the park and inside the park are stocked with trout since the 1960s and so um, there is great fly fishing and I, as a fly fisherman, you can see me on this, this picture, I, I intend to, uh, to, to encourage people to fish. Um, to summarise, and this is the second to last slide, um, we believe we have a fantastic location. We have multiple habitats, not just the three inside the park, but Dua Sheikh Hussein and, and Sof Omar to the north, and the Rift Valley and the dry, dusty conditions to the south at Dolomena, with the camel trains and, and, and markets to the south. We have a beautiful secluded location with 40 kilometers from the nearest town. Um, we have very strong links with conservation organizations, and we intend to encourage research um, and, uh, and, and uh, conservation um, and make that accessible to our guests. And we have phenomenal uh, endemic birds and mammals and a, a stunning place in which to relax, explore and really you have the opportunity to do things if you wish to or to do absolutely nothing and unwind if you don't wish to. Finally I'll leave you with a few pictures. Um, this is up on the plateau, lovely uh, clear water, waterfalls into a, into a mountain uh, lake. Uh, the, the upper Tagona Valley which is really um, one of the rivers which we intend to fish. Uh, but this is on the north side of the plateau. And one thing I haven't mentioned about Ethiopia is that the people are absolutely stunning, as you can see from the following slide. That is a joke, by the way, just in case you didn't realize. Um, guys, um, that was my 20 minutes, and I have to say that uh, thank you for your attention. Um, you can get in touch with us, or you can get in touch with Small World Marketing, who are our marketing company, and ask any questions you wish to ask. Um, and uh, we're on info at barleymountainlodge.com or you can look at our website at www.barleymountainlodge.com um, I hope that you've enjoyed what I had to say I hope that um, well, we're going to be open in October by the way after, the, after this year's rains and I hope that I'll get the chance to meet many of you in the future thank you for your time